Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to be starting out this new unit in Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is all about functions and modeling information using graphs. Um, and in this section here, we're going to be doing a lot of review of what we've done in the past. In fact, a lot of this ch chapter is going to be review of what you've done in advanced algebra. Um, but we just want to make sure, especially for this first section, that we have a solid understanding of some of the terms and things that we'll be using throughout this chapter. So let's go ahead and look at some of these terms. Uh, let's start by talking about, well, what is a relation? You're going to hear that word used frequently. A relation is just a set of ordered pairs. If you sat down and wrote down a bunch of coordinates, you just came up with a relation. So a relation is just a bunch of, it's a set of coordinates. And within those coordinates, again, they're called an ordered pair for a reason. We have an order to them. The x comes first, the y comes second. Well, the x values, we call those the independent variables, and the y values, we call those the dependent variables. So another way to look at the independent variable is it's your input variable. It's the numbers, that's where we're going to put numbers into an equation, where the y value is where we're getting our answers, our output from. Another way to look at the independent variable is that the independent variable is independent of anything. It can happen on its own. You can pick any numbers you want, maybe within a certain category, but you can put those numbers, pick those numbers for x. But the values for y, or the values for the dependent variable, depend on the numbers that we use for x. So that's the difference between the two. Then next we have a function. A function is a special kind of relation. Remember, a relation is just any kind of, any set of coordinates. And a function takes a set of coordinates and looks at them and looks to see if we can give it that special status of calling it a function. Well, how do we know if it gets that special status of calling it a function? Well, it's where each x is paired with one y. Now, there's a number of ways that you can determine whether something's a function. We'll look at a couple of those ways uh, today. But if you ever look at a table, or if you look get a set of numbers. The easiest way in that case to see if it's a function is you look at your independent variables, you look at your x's maybe, and you see if there's any repeats. So let's say if there's a negative 2 and another negative 2. Then what you do is you say, okay, it looks like there's repeats, so I want to see are those negative 2 paired up with different uh, values for y. So if one negative 2 is paired up with a 5 and the other negative 2 is paired up with a 7, what you have is you have the negative 2 paired up with a 5 and a 7, meaning it's not a function. But if each x is paired up with different values for y's, then it is a function. Now we have a domain and range. That you should be familiar with, but just to review, your domain is a set of x values for the function, and the range is a set of y values for the function. If you have a hard time figuring out and keeping them straight which one's domain and which one's range, just remember that d comes before r in the alphabet, x comes before y in the alphabet, so domain and x's both come first, the domain refers to the set of x's, the range and the y's both come second in the alphabet, so the range refers to the y's. Now in this next section that we're going to be talking about, we're going to be looking at some different symbols um, for different types of numbers. Uh, the idea here is just to be exposed to, to this concept, it's not a huge emphasis here. I just want to make sure that you're clear that the biggest emphasis is knowing all of these um, different terms and then the other parts that we look at, but it's good to be exposed to how we can refer to some different types of numbers. So let's look at that next. Okay, so here up above me we have these different categories of numbers, and these are categories that we talked a lot about last year. Especially, let's start with the R. So what that R represents is that R represents all real numbers, and they see it typed in as a font, but the way that we write it is you start out with the two uh, lines for your R and then just draw your rest of your R as normal. And again, what that represents is that represents a much shorter and easier way for us to refer to all real numbers. Now what are the real numbers? The real numbers are pretty much any number you can think of. Positive numbers, negative numbers, fractions, decimals, uh, anything you can think of as long as it's not a non-real number, which would be like using imaginary numbers or the square root of negative 1, uh, that would not be a real number. But any other number that you're familiar with would be a real number. Now let's, from there, let's start actually talking about the bottom. Let's talk about uh, the natural numbers. Now the natural numbers I like to call your counting numbers. Now if I asked you to count to 100, what number would you start with? You'd start with 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. So 
natural numbers start with 1, and they are those counting numbers all the way through infinity. They don't stop at 100. They, they keep going on and on. But 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. Then moving up to the next category of numbers that includes some more types of numbers would be integers. So integers include those counting numbers, but they also include 0 because 0 is not included as a natural number, so it doesn't so it's not including 0. So natural numbers don't include 0. But integers, those include numbers like 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. But it also includes 0, and then negative 1, then negative 2, then negative 3. It's kind of like the numbers that you'd put along a number line. Okay? The numbers that you'd put along the scale. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to infinity, and then the negative of numbers. Negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, and so on. So those are your set of integers. Then the other category of number that we have would be your rational numbers. Because integers do not include um, decimals or fractions. Okay? Uh, but rational numbers do. So the definition of a rational number is any number that can be written as a fraction. So the number 5 is a rational number because we could write 5 as 5 over 1. 0.25 would be 1 fourth. 0.6 repeating would be 2 thirds. So the way that you can tell if a decimal would qualify as a rational number, because you might not know if it can be written as a fraction, like 0.125, can that be written as a fraction? Well, if you're not sure, the way, that tell, the way to tell is if you look to see, is it repeating? If it's a decimal that has a repeating pattern, then it's a rational number. Does it terminate? 0.125, it terminates. As long as you're not rounding, if it terminates, if it ends, then it's a rational number. But otherwise, if it keeps going on and on, it doesn't repeat, so it doesn't have follow a pattern like pi, for example, then it's an irrational number, not a rational number. But the letter we use to represent a rational number would be the letter Q. So these are some of the common types of numbers that we're going to be looking at. Now let's look over at the paragraph there on the left. It says, if x is in the set A, so if we have a number that's in a, in a larger set of numbers, we say that it's an element of that set. Now, the symbol that we use to represent an element is this little curved E. So we say that X is an element of A is the way that we'd write that. For example, 3.5. That's a decimal that terminates. So it's an element of the rational numbers. And if we read on there, I don't want to confuse you too much, but if you read on there, um, it talks about how to identify the even set of numbers. So if we use N to represent the, all the integers, then 2n would represent all the even numbers, because 2 times 1 is 2, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times 3 is 6, and so on. So that's where we get our even numbers from. And the way that we would say that, or we could write that, is with uh, set builder notation. We could say the set, anytime we have anything inside those brackets, uh, we would say it's a set. So it's a set of two all the 2n's, such that n is a sub is this um, element of the integers, which I just realized. That should actually be not a Q, that should actually be the Z. But anyhow, so that is how we'd identify the set of all even integers. Now what's up above, or what's, I'm sorry, what's over here in green? That's very important. This is how we're going to identify whether something's, um, or the proper way that we refer to something that's a function. So if something's a function, the way that we phrase that is we say that blank is a function of blank. The dependent variable is a function of the independent variable. So that order is really important. So anytime that, so in your assignment, if they, if they phrase something like the example that we're going to be looking at here in a minute, and they say, is one piece a function of the other, or they switch it around, and you need to figure out which one it is, the first step is to figure out, well, which is my independent variable and which is my dependent variable, because that will tell you the order it goes in. The dependent variable is a function of the independent variable is the way that we phrase it. So let's look at an example where we're going to have to use that phrase. Okay, so here it says a bakery charges $2 per muffin. Customers get a $2 discount for every six muffins purchased. Which statement is true? Would we say the cost is a function of the number of muffins, or would we say the number of muffins is a function of the cost? Well, we're actually going to start with part B here. Well, let's first identify what the independent variable and dependent variables are, because that will help us answer part A. Actually, I'm going to move this over. Okay, so let's see what we would say here. So the independent variable versus the dependent variable. So remember, the independent variable is going to happen on its own, and the dependent variable 
like I said, depends on the independent variable. So we need to ask ourselves, well, does the number of muffins depend on the cost? Or does the cost depend on the number of muffins? And if you said the second statement is true, or if you're thinking that, that is correct. The cost depends on the number of muffins that we purchased. So the independent variable is the number of muffins. The dependent variable then is going to be the cost. So knowing that, the phrase that we're going to use is the dependent variable is a function of the independent variable. So we would say the cost is a function of the number of muffins, which is what we have here. So that would be your answer. The cost is a function of the number of muffins. Let's look at part C. Part C says state the domain and range of the function. Well, remember the domain, we get that from the independent variable. And remember the range, we get that from the dependent variable. But you can't just say, oh, the, in, the domain is going to be the number of muffins. That's not what they're looking for here. They want to look for what set of numbers would be in the domain. So this is going to involve a little bit of thinking. So take a minute and think, what kind of numbers would we not use to describe the number of muffins we could purchase? Well, hopefully you're thinking and hopefully you've thought about the fact that, well, we wouldn't buy a negative amount of muffins, so we wouldn't include negative numbers as part of our domain. Or maybe you thought of decimals because you're not going to go into the store and take a bite out of one and say, well, I'm going to pay for the, the bite that I just bid out. No, you're not going to buy a decimal amount of muffins. So, in other words, we're focusing on our integers. Now, you might say, well, what about our natural numbers? Can't we just say that our domain is going to be all the natural numbers because we could buy one muffin, two muffins, three muffins, and so on? Well, the problem is, is that remember that natural numbers do not include zero. And think, can I go into the store to buy muffins and walk out without having bought any? Yeah. So, reasonably, I could... Um, have a situation where I don't buy any muffins. So I could have my domain, my domain could include zero. So here's how we're going to describe the domain. It's going to be this. My domain is going to be the non-negative integers. It's kind of an interesting way to phrase it. Why couldn't I just say it's the positive integers? Well, think about that for a second. Because positive integers do not include the number of zero. Zero is neither negative nor, nor positive. So if I want to include zero and one and two and three and so on, I have to describe that to say it's the non-negative integers. Okay, now let's talk about the range. The range, we get the values from our range from our costs. So now I've got to think about, well, what are some prices that it could be paying? Remember, it's $2 per muffin. Well, I could buy zero muffins and pay $0. I could buy one muffin. One muffin would cost me $2. Two muffins would cost me $4. Three muffins would cost me $6. Four muffins would cost me $8, and so on. So if you notice, I'm counting by twos. So I'm using my, so it's the, or another way to look at it is it's my even integers. But be careful. We've got to make sure to include zero. So the way I'm going to describe this is. So I would say that this is going to be my non-negative even integers, okay? Because we'd have zero, two dollars, four dollars, six dollars, eight dollars, and so on. So that would be my range. So hopefully you've understood this so far. So we're going to stop the video here. And in the second part of the video, we're going to focus more on how to find the uh, determine if something's a function. Um, how to find the domain and range by looking at a graph, and so on. So with that, we'll stop this video. Um, but if you want to, watch the next video to learn how to do the second part of this lesson.